Thank you for the really well curated um, session. I think it's been interesting hearing Fabienne talk about the technical side of affective computing and um, emotion capture. My talk's a little bit more about the social side of things and the social impact of affective computing. Um, the recent study that I've been working on essentially has evolved around 100 interviews with um, leading companies, leading organizations, um, and sectors interested in use of um, affective computing in various forms. Um, these are technical, these are com commercial, these are surveillance, these are city-based, and they're governmental. But the talk today is about essentially about three things. And it's about thinking about the implications of being able to see, read, lead, read, listen, feel, classify, and learn and interact with emotional life. But perhaps the more interesting part for this room will be what citizens actually think about emotion capture. And sometimes, you know, kind of citizens themselves tend to get missed out of this equation, perhaps um, in kind of preference of the technological. And then finally, we'll have a think about what responsible innovation in this sector might actually consist of. So just a few definitions, just to clarify that we're actually on the same page. I'm using a very, very general um, definition of AI. It simply means the study of agents uh, that receive percepts from the environment and perform actions. But in terms of emotional AI, essentially it, kind of revolt, it comes from affective computing. It reflects an interest in machines that are able to use AI techniques to sense and feel into emotional life. So affective computing is kind of really perhaps an example of um, weak AI rather than strong AI in that it reads and reacts to emotions through text and biometric sensing but these systems tend not to think and feel for themselves. But I think what is important in terms of thinking about kind of trajectory of kind of AI based technologies in that certainly when it comes to people AI systems um, that inter one might reason that these agents have no value until they're sensitive to feelings, emotions, and intentions. So this interest in affective computing and the connection with kind of AI systems, when it involves people, you know, um, it's kind of pretty much indivisible, I think. So apologies for the, the screen grab from, um, uh, from, a doc, from a report that I wrote that's cited at the end, but essentially what this is, this is about the kind of the who, the what, and the why. So in terms of the who, Who's actually using emotion-sensitive technologies? And we see it's actually a wide range. So we've heard a little bit about in terms of um, coaches. But, you know, there's a wide range. Advertisers, perhaps most obviously at the top, AI cognitive services. Artists um, are getting very much kind of on board with these types of technology. We heard about cars um, in kind of earlier um, conversations. And as you kind of make your own way through the list, you see kind of a diverse range of sectors who are keenly, not just tangentially, but keenly interested in information about emotional life. So this isn't an exhaustive list. It's just some of the key ones. So what we can take away from this, that there is a widespread overall sense of interest in emotional life. But in relation to voice and digital assistance, um, you know, the, the subject of this summit, I think what mass use of voice-based emotion capture promises is this notion of intimacy at scale. And we've heard about the rhetoric of personalization for a long time, since the early 90s. But this notion of intimacy at scale is perhaps slightly different. And the point's well made in the film, um, Spike Jones' movie, Her, where the, the main protagonist, a guy called Theodore Wombly, falls in love with an operating system called Samantha. And while, we're, while in the large part of this conference we're focusing on the technical side, we shouldn't miss the human side of this equation either. That is, although Wombly is quite aware that Samantha is an AI, and that Samantha is pushing his Darwinian buttons. He's willing to suspend disbelief, and I think this notion of suspension of disbelief is quite an important psychological factor. And importantly, he's, he's willing to overlook this artifice to gain gratification from the relationship. So it's not necessarily a case that the AI has to be human-like, it's the case that it has to be useful, um, so as to suspend disbelief. And I think what's also useful about the film as well is that it shows opportunity for co-emergent relationships that is not just the systems that develop, 
but it's also the people who use the AIs that develop as well. So it's kind of an interesting scope for kind of tracking behavior in relation to AI usage. So in a sense, what kind of Wombly does is he sacrifices realism for utility, and I think as we see in the film, um, also companionship. So in a sense, what we can also do is kind of look backwards and look forward. Um, her is just a movie, of course. But as I'm guessing many of you will know, um, Eliza was uh, an early AI from the 1960s that played the role of a Rogerian psychiatrist. Um, developed by, um, in the US by a guy called Joseph Weissenbaum, he found that people formed really strong emotional connections with Eliza. And one of the things that really shocked him, remember it's 1960s, it's quite a while ago, and one of the things that really shocked him when he kind of developed this very early eye was the extent to which patients anthropomorphized Eliza. So this notion of anthropomorphization, again, is a key one. So really what we're looking at there, in terms of how this anthropomorphization is caused, it's caused by the appearance of psychological autonomy, a sense of aliveness, the following of social conventions, and the establishing of human-machine rela human relationships that is actually significant to people. But in a more modern context, um, there was a really interesting um, TechCrunch report recently um, from um, a woman called Lisa Yearsley um, of an AI startup called Cognia. And one of the things that she found, and this kind of actually echoes um, um, Eliza as well, is that people are willing to speak to AI assistants for longer than they are human assistants. That's interesting, perhaps kind of for the more business-minded among us. But secondly, and perhaps kind of arguably cause for concern as well, is that they're volunteering a lot of personal secrets, intimate secrets. So people feel much more comfortable speaking with AIs than they do other people. And I think, again, that's, that's kind of really quite significant on a number of fronts. In terms of the emotional dimension of this, I think it's, it's interesting to think about how the comprehension of emotions inter helps assistants interact more naturally. And Fabienne talked um, quite eloquently about this. And I think it's interesting in terms of how our own behavior essentially primes systems to respond to us. So whereas in affective computing and behavioral sciences, we usually talk about manipulating human users by embedding stimuli that will influence the user to behave in a prescribed way but we can look at this the other way around. Emotional behavior tells the system to respond in an appropriate way. So we can take two words, good morning. Good morning can be said a number of ways. It can be said irritatingly, Monday morning, good morning. Good morning can be kind of vaguely grumpy, we need coffee. And then we kind of have the person, the final good morning, you stay well clear of that person. So each of those different types of good mornings tells the system to respond in quite different ways. First one, excitable. Second one, perhaps we should get this person more coffee, maybe needs a biscuit. Third, stay well clear. So from the point of view, kind of looking at the role of emotions, this obviously has a really significant for marketers and advertisers. And I think when we're kind of looking at where kind of some of the real take-up is going to be and where certainly kind of where a lot of the investment is, it's definitely kind of on the advertising, marketing and retail side. Again, in terms of how uh, emotions prime systems and prime spaces and prime environments to respond to us and to set off different machine behavioral vectors. So, in terms of these systems, they introduce new so social and economic questions. And specifically, is it desirable, is it entirely desirable that machines are able to use, sense, and feel into human emotional life? What are the implications of this? What are the implications of being able to see, read, listen, feel, classify, learn, and interact with emotional life? Because really what we're talking about is we're talking about making people an emotional life machine readable. And this is a really quite profound development. We're used to online personal profiling. We're used to having behavior mapped in terms of um, alphanumeric codes. But what we're talking about is kind, of, is kind of something a lot more kind of personal, something a lot more um, tangible, indeed affective. So on the one hand, these systems are great. They naturalize 
interaction with technology and provides, provides scope for valuable relationships. And I think, you know, perhaps when you kind of start thinking about kind of older people, you know, possibly kind of who don't necessarily, um, yeah, who kind of seek kind of wider connections. But of course, the concerns are very real. Um, in terms of um, commercial, governmental, um, and exploitation of emotional life. And I think perhaps the really key part of that is the sense of which kind of the scope is there to cr cr treat people as objects rather than subjects. That for me seems like a big deal. Um, so I've got five minutes left. But I was interested in what people think. What do everyday citizens think of all of this? So I ran a survey, a UK survey, across all demographics and um, across the entire UK of 2,067 people to gauge attitudes um, to potential for emotion capture in a range of different contexts. And one of the questions that I asked was, was on voice capture. And this seems obviously kind of particularly relevant here. So I kind of phrased it in terms of voice analytics companies collecting information about moods and voice data, i.e. not just what people say, but also how they say it. Well, I like to put it in terms of reference to smartphones and voice birth search. I wasn't, I wasn't actually thinking about Amazon Echo at this point or Alexa, but it obviously kind of seems quite relevant. So in terms of the answers, they had the following possibilities. One, that they're okay, they're not okay, I should say, with data about collected by them being collected in any way, shape, or form. No emotions whatsoever. Second possibility is that they're actually okay with it, but as long as it's anonymized, so as long as it can't be connected back with personally identifiable information. The third option was that they're okay to have it linked with personally identifiable information. And the fourth option was, don't know. So in terms of the, the results themselves, the results are actually kind of quite interesting. So in terms of people's thoughts about emotion capture technologies, over 53% were not interested at all. They did not like it. So this is in relation to kind of voice-based emotion capture. They did not like it at all, whether it's personally identifiable or not. More, 28% were slightly more interested. They said, well, yeah, you know, perhaps we can kind of see some of the uses of this and that they're okay that, as long as it's not connected with personally identifiable information. Third category, only 8%, 8.4% are okay with having this connected with personally identifiable information and 10% don't know. What was interesting, I haven't got the slide with me, but age um, kind of made things slightly different. So older people really didn't like it. Younger people, more accepting. Now that doesn't mean that people are more, um, are kind of okay with emotion capture full stop. They really didn't like it when information about emotions was collected with, connected with personally identifiable information. If you want some more, um, you want some more information about that, talk to me after um, the talk. But what that says to me is that younger people are more interested in novel ways of interacting, but they want control over the process. So forget everything that you've ever heard about, the young kids don't care about privacy. Not true. They are interested in new modes of interaction, but want control over the process. Um, I'm going to jump that slide um, because I'm running slightly out of time. But in terms of what that means for developers, self-interest. There is self-interest in good data ethics, good privacy ethics. So think about what people are actually interested in. Listen to what citizens say. They're really not keen on having personally identifiable information connected with emotions. Bring them in. Bring them in at the development process. Bring them in before you start designing the technology. Listen to what they say. Consider notions such as value um, based design. Consider notions of privacy by design. And when we say privacy, that's not necessarily meant to be a break on what you do. It's meant to be about enabling control for users. In terms of kind of practical things, it was under, this has actually kind of come from many of the corporations that I actually spoke with, and many developers. And for them, you know, the only way to do, for good, do good privacy ethics um, in a motion based context is to keep de -level, device level processing, keeping data out of the cloud. I don't know whether that ship has sailed, um, but it certainly seems um, one option. And finally, meaningful opt in. I don't mean opt in in terms of tick boxes, I mean meaningful opt in, where the user themselves is fully aware, conscious of the decisions that they're making. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you.